Hello, in this video, we're going to talk about acute tonsillitis. Before delving into um, the condition, we need to learn about the anatomy. Now, the tonsils are part of what is called Wild Dyer's Ring. Generally, when talking about the tonsils, we're talking about the palatine tonsils, situated on both sides of the throat. There are also the adenoids, the tubule tonsils, and lingual tonsils, which make up Wild Dyer's Ring. The tonsils are a lymphoid organ containing macrophages, T cells, and B cells. The immune cells here are important in learning and building up the immune response. The tonsils are important in the early years of life because the lymphoid tissues containing the immune cells are continuously exposed to many antigens. So that is why until the age of six, tonsils are typically hyperplastic. They're big and tend to regress, so basically shrink, by 12 years of age. The palatine tonsils have a strong blood supply from five different vessels. That is why there is a risk of a lot of bleeding with uh, tonsillectomy, removal of the tonsils. Zooming into the tonsils, we can see they have deep crypts and lymph nodules. The crypts are normally colonized by many species of bacteria and also exposed to many viral organisms. Then you have lymph nodules which contain immune cells that are your T cells, B cells, and macrophages. Many viral and bacterial organisms can cause tonsillitis, which is inflammation of the tonsils, causing tonsillar edema, hypertrophy, erythema, redness, and pain. The inflammation may affect other areas of the back of the throat, including the adenoids and the lingual tonsils. This inflammatory response produces exudate, either white, gray, or yellow discharge. Cultures are not often useful in distinguishing the offending pathogens, because even if you grow something, they are probably commensal organisms anyway. They live there naturally. Generally, with acute tonsillitis, the pharynx is also inflamed, which is the back of your throat. And so a better definition is pharyngotonsillitis rather than acute tonsillitis. In this video, we will use both terminologies. Now, the majority of cases of tonsillitis are caused by viruses. Common viral organisms that cause tonsillitis include Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, adenovirus, rhinovirus, respiratory syncytial virus, influenza, and parainfluenza. The most common bacterial causes of acute tonsillitis is group A streptococcus, also known as strep pyogenes. We will focus on the two most important clinical causes of acute tonsillitis, that is Epstein-Barr virus and group A streptococcus, also known as strep pyogenes. Let's begin by looking at EBV. Now, EBV, Epstein-Barr virus, infection is usually asymptomatic. If EBV virus infection causes symptoms, it can be part of a condition called infectious mononucleosis. So we'll be mainly focusing on infectious mononucleosis here. And infectious mononucleosis most often begins insidiously with fatigue, vague malaise, followed by several days later of sore throat, pharyngotonsillitis, headaches, fever, swollen posterior cervical lymph nodes. In some people, there can be hepatomegaly, leading to complications such as hepatitis, and splenomegaly, which may present with splenic rupture. Epstein-Barr virus is a virus uh, that is part of the herpes family and is transmitted via saliva. That is why EBV infection is also known as the kissing disease. Once in the body, the Epstein-Barr virus targets B cells in the oropharynx, such as in the tonsils. And so in the tonsils, they replicate and conquer um, as the body builds up an immune res uh, response. Investigations for infectious mononucleosis include a full blood count, which may show lymphocytosis, high lymphocyte count thrombocytopenia, low platelets, and then you also want to do electrourea creatinine, liver function test, and CRP. A monospot test is a useful test to perform and is very quick. A monospot test looks at heterophile antibodies, 
which are produced by those abnormal B cells infected by the Epstein-Barr virus. Further investigations that can be performed include Epstein-Barr virus-specific antibodies and throat swabs to look for differential diagnosis such as group A streptococcus. Treatment for symptomatic Epstein-Barr virus infection, which is infectious mononucleosis, is usually conservative and include pain and temperature relief using ibuprofen and paracetamol, adequate rest, fluids, and good nutrition. Primary Epstein-Barr virus infection rarely require more than supportive treatment. Rarely, the enlarged tonsils will cause an airway obstruction. But if it does happen, it is important to admit the person, and they will likely need ENT involvement. Steroids are given to reduce swelling. Then potentially a nasopharyngeal airway is required. Intubation rarely, and especially emergency tonsillectomy or tracheostomy may be required, which is again rare. Complications of Epstein-Barr virus infection include a splenic rupture, leukoplakia, Burkitt's lymphoma, lymphoproliferative diseases as well. In some cases, Epstein-Barr virus tonsillitis is treated with antibiotics accidentally, usually ampicillin, which when given in someone who has Epstein-Barr virus tonsillitis, will cause a fine macular rash in up to 90% of people. The mechanism is unknown. Which leads to group A streptococcus, the bacterial cause of acute tonsillitis. Group A streptococcus or streptococcus pyogenes is the most common bacterial cause of acute tonsillitis. Pharyngotonsillitis caused by group A streptococcus is sometimes referred to as strep throat. The majority of episodes of pharyngitis are caused by viral infections as discussed and is usually treated conservatively. However, early recognition of group A streptococcus is important since failure to appropriately treat someone who has strep throat may lead to group A streptococcus complications. Unfortunately, distinguishing between viral and bacterial uh, acute tonsillitis is difficult. The group A streptococcus are beta hemolytic cocci, able to produce some exotoxins and also contain many surface antigens that play a vital role in the pathophysiology, such as the M proteins. Transmission of strep throat is through saliva and nasal secretion from an infected person. Here, group A streptococcus targets palatine tonsils. However, it's also important to remember group A streptococcus is a common commensal organism as well. Clinical features. The incubation period of strep throat is usually two to five days of no symptoms. When symptoms do arise, bacterial tonsillitis causes sudden onset fevers, sore throat, pharyngitis and tonsillitis, which are red, enlarged, and have perlant exudate. On the soft palate, you can also potentially see palate petechiae. Here is a photo of strep throat. Note the enlarged tonsils and exudate in yellow. Other features of group A streptococcus tonsillitis include dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, odanophagia, pain when swallowing, and tender cervical lymphadenopathy. On physical examination, the pharynx is red, tonsils are red and enlarged with perlant exudate. A throat swab can be performed. A throat swab with microscopic culture sensitivity in blood agar will help diagnose group A streptococcus because it will show a beta hemolytic cocci. The throat swab for rapid antigen detection test, RADT, can also be used. In general though, throat swabs are not very useful because remember, group A streptococcus are commensal organisms in many patients. Other investigations uh, for group A streptococcus related tonsillitis include a full blood count, which will show neutrophilia, 
Now, it's an important concept to remember to help differentiate viral and bacterial tonsillitis. Remember, lymphocytosis supports a viral cause of acute tonsillitis, whereas neutrophilia, high neutrophil count, supports a bacterial cause. Early recognition and management is important to reduce complications associated with group A streptococcus uh, throat infection. The management for streptococcus throat infection are antibiotics, specifically penicillin or amoxicillin. It's also important to monitor for complications of the antibiotics themselves. So when you give someone antibiotics with someone who has acute tonsillitis, firstly, if a rash eruption occurs, ask yourself, Ask yourself, could this be a virus penicillin reaction, which will support a diagnosis of Epstein-Barr virus tonsillitis rather than a bacterial tonsillitis, in which case you have to stop the antibiotics. The second thing to think about is whether this could be a proper allergic reaction to the antibiotic, in which case you would have to stop the antibiotic and change it potentially. The third thing is you have to ask yourself, could this be a complication of a group A streptococcus, which is scarlet fever? There, they also get a rash everywhere. Then you have other complications of group A streptococcus, which we will not talk about in this video, but can be seen in a video uh, specifically on strep throat. Important terminologies to remember regarding tonsillitis is something called recurrent tonsillitis. Now, sometimes people experience recurrent tonsillitis, up to several attacks of acute tonsillitis a year and no symptoms in between attacks. Then you have chronic tonsillitis. Sometimes people suffer from chronic tonsillitis, which is when a sore throat is present for at least three months and is associated with tonsillar inflammation, halitosis, which is smelly breath, and persistent tender uh, cervical lymphadenopathy. Chronic tonsillitis may also be associated with tonsillolith, which are biofilms that form within the tonsillar crypts, which leads us to the management of tonsillitis. Obviously, we have the different causes, the viral and bacterial, but you know, sometimes the tonsils have to be removed. And this is called tonsillectomy. Now, there are specific indications for tonsillectomy. And this is because, firstly, the tonsils play an important role in the first 6 to 12 years of life with the whole immune system business. Secondly, because there are actually a lot of complications associated with tonsillectomy due to its anatomy and location, it's very important, uh, you know, it's very important to follow the indications for removing the tonsils. The indications for tonsillectomy include recurrent tonsillitis, which means several attacks, I think six in one year, having chronic tonsillitis, having a peritonsillar abscess, tonsilloliths, which we mentioned earlier, having obstructive symptoms, tonsillitis, which causes obstructive symptoms, such as an Epstein-Barr virus, for example, uh, or something that will cause obstructive sleep apnea. And finally, a very important indication is sus suspected malignancy. Complications of tonsillectomy, which is very important, include general anesthesia associated complications, dental injury, temporomandibular joint dislocation during the procedure, post-operative bleeding, because remember, there's a lot of blood supply to the tonsils, airway obstruction, causing pulmonary edema, as well as aspiration of any contents during the surgery. So in summary, acute tonsillitis is inflammation of the tonsils. The two most clinically important ones are tonsillitis caused by Epstein-Barr virus and group A streptococcus. But majority of acute tonsillitis are caused by viruses just random viruses in general. Tonsillectomy is removal of the tonsils and have specific indications, but also keep in mind that there are complications associated with tonsillectomy. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video.